Folks, we're going to um, get into uh, the message that God has for me to share with you today, and it's a message I believe we all need to hear, but I'm going to ask uh, God's blessing on this time before we begin. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for this season of Lent where we can be reminded of uh, your cross. we got the big cross up here in front of the church, and every time we walk into this place, it reminds us of your incredible love for us and what you went through, Lord God, so that we could be forgiven. And uh, you wanted to take care of that because you loved us that much, and uh, Jesus did. He was faithful to the end, and he took care of that, and uh, we just give you thanks that we can talk about this time today, what all it meant, Jesus' ministry and the cross, and what it means to our lives today. So thank you for this time. I pray that you'll open up our minds and our hearts just to receive all that you have for us. And Lord, we've come to this place for a variety of reasons. We like visiting with each other and seeing friends and so forth, but the main reason we come here is to hear from you. Help each and every one of us to hear from you today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I've had the privilege of doing in my life, and I, and I mean a privilege and I count it a privilege, is being with people just before they've taken their last breath or during the final moments of their life and some of the things they say, um, you know, have, it's been a variety of things. You know, some people will maybe speak to a need they have. Uh, I remember one of my dad's, uh, I, I want to say it was like Jesus, and he said, I am thirsty. But it wasn't quite that way. He said, uh, Ram, I'm bone dry. I think that's a southern way of saying I'm thirsty. <laughs> so that was one of the last things I heard him say and got him a drink and uh, walked out of his room, and he died the next day. But uh, so those were some final words that he said. And, you know, sometimes it's just, could you move a pillow? May I have a drink? Sometimes they express concern for others. It's, I love you, or they're telling somebody else. You know, they're the ones dying, and they're telling somebody else, don't worry, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, you know? And that's one of those things. And, and I've told you this before, but my mother's last words, I lost my mom at 67 years old. She died of brain cancer and only had like a couple months before that that we even knew about it, so it was a rather quick thing. But her last words, and I'm so thankful for these last words for many reasons, especially because my dad needed to hear them at the time. But she said, I'm happy. Francis, how are you? I'm happy. I'm happy. Now, was she really happy about the situation, somebody dying of brain cancer? Probably not. But we knew what she meant. What she was talking about was the joy that joy that God can put in us that transcends any circumstance that we're involved in in this life. And, and so her last words were, I'm happy. And then I always think, of course, from my studies or whatever, of, of the founder of Methodism, of, of uh, uh, these churches, you know, whether EUB or Methodist, they all kind of came from the Wesleys. And John Wesley's final words were these. He said, best of all, God is with us. Best of all, God is with us. He not only believed in, but he realized at that moment the presence of God with him in a very powerful way and knew that we could all realize the presence of God in our lives, not just when we come to church, but every day of the week, you know, as we walk with God and as we put our faith into action. You know, in the case of the crucifixion, though, we're going to be talking about Jesus. There's our beautiful cross uh, up front, and we're reminded of the crucifixion every time we walk into this place. That's the symbol of our Christian faith. But in the case of crucifixion, the very act of speaking would have been a painful, painful thing to do. We don't think about this. You know, uh, we study the last words of Christ, but we don't think about what he went through during this time. But what somebody would have had to do is, is pull themselves up by those nails that were going through their wrists in order to have enough lung capacity to expand your lungs to speak out loud. And so this is what Jesus did. You know, for somebody being crucified to even speak would require a great effort. There wasn't many words coming from those crosses of the people being crucified because speaking out loud was a painful, painful event. So for all these reasons, folks, words are sparse among those who are being crucified. Yet Jesus felt it important enough to speak out loud, not once, not twice, but seven times. Not just words, but phrases. We call them the last words of Christ, but they're really phrases. And today we're going to be talking about the first phrase, the first thing he said from the cross and how incredible that is. But I want to share with you a little bit of scripture, and then we're going to hear from one who was there. 
we're going to hear from one who was there, and we're going to do this each Sunday that we meet during this season. But let me share this scripture with you just to get started today. This is called the crucifixion in, in my Bible, but it's Luke 23 and beginning with verse 26. And here's what verse 26 says, and I think you probably will remember this. You've heard it before. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. Doesn't tell you he was bringing in a couple kids with him, you know, but, uh, but he was. He had a family. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. I'm going to jump down to verse 33. When they finally, so he helped, helped carry the cross, when they finally came to the place called the skull. There's different words for this. When, the, when the, uh, um, we sang this morning about Calvary, Calvary is another word for the place of the cross. Golgotha is another word you will hear, G-O-L, Golgotha, uh, that means place of the skull or whatever. And this is where they crucified him in that area. Well, there they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. And then Jesus said, so here's his first words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Now we're going to hear from one. Who was there? John? Simon of Cyrene. We had spent two weeks sailing from the north coast of Africa to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. My sons were small boys, yet old enough to feel the excitement as we approached the holy city. As our small caravan came over the last hill, Rufus let out a shout. Look, Father, the temple. There she stood, the earthly palace of God, gleaming as she towered over the city. Though my family had lived in Cyrene for generations, Jerusalem was for us, as for every Jew, our heart's home. The night before we joined our cousins in Bethany for the Passover cedar that marked the beginning of the festival, sharing a meal and recalling God's salvation of our people. We ended that meal as we did every year, praying for the coming of the Messiah. The next morning, Rufus, Alexander, and I left early to spend the day in Jerusalem, visiting the temple and then the festival taking place near the markets. As we approached the city, we saw what appeared to be a parade coming our way, but soon we could see this was no parade. There were Roman soldiers driving three criminals toward the rock quarry where criminals were crucified. Each of these criminals was carrying a heavy beam across his shoulders. One clearly had been badly beaten, for his body was bloodied and he looked as though he could barely walk. I took Rufus and Alexander by the hand and pulled them away from the road. I did not want them to see this terrible thing. Just then the tragic figure, the sorely wounded man, stumbled and fell at my feet. I saw that his brow was wrapped in a crude crown of thorns, and suddenly I realized who this man was. This was Jesus of Nazareth, whom some claimed was the Messiah. He had been critical of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. I could not believe it. They had actually sentenced him to death. Everything happened so quickly. I was lost in my thoughts when I heard one of the soldiers say, You there, you carry his cross. And you, Jesus, get to your feet. There was nothing I could do. I told my boys, stay close. I picked up the beam, far heavier than I had imagined, and pitched it over my shoulder. Then I reached out a hand to Jesus to help him up. He was clearly in pain, but there was still in his face a strength and determination. He looked him in the eyes as if to thank me, and then he set his face toward Calvary. It was only a five-minute walk to the place they called the Skull, Golgotha, where the Romans crucified their victims. Dropping the beam before the executioners, I stepped back, searching for my boys. 
And then we stood and watched as they assembled the cross. Then they stripped Jesus naked and laid him atop the beams. They stretched his arms to the sides before they drove spikes into his wrists as he shouted in pain. Then they nailed his ankles into the side of the cross, one on the right and one on the left. Finally, they hoisted his cross up and in position, and as they did, he let out another shout of pain. Because I had never been so close to a crucifixion, I had not realized what a horrible thing this was. Rufus began to cry. Alexander became nauseous. There were two thieves being crucified with Jesus, and the soldiers hoisted each one into the air. The Romans shouted to the crowd, Take a look at your king now. This is a lesson from Rome. Don't forget it. The soldiers, laughing, began to throw dice for his clothing. Some in the crowd wept. Others hurled in insults at him. The religious leaders stood with their arms crossed, a strange expression of satisfaction on their faces. And then Jesus took a deep breath, and someone in the crowd said, Shh, he's about to say something. This is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I would never forget these words. A dying man, tortured and crucified, praying that God would forgive his tormentors. What kind of a man would do such a thing? His words would haunt me the rest of my life. Ultimately, they would be the reason I became one of his followers. The Witness of Simon of Cyrene. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Folks, before I forget, sometimes we take things for granted when we walk into the sanctuary and we don't really pay attention to things around us. But I just wanted to call your attention before I go on any further to the second window from the back on that side. That's our crucifixion window. Each window tells a story. This tells the stories of the crucifixion, the stories of Lent. So please make sure you take a look at that sometime during the season. Walk over and take a good look at it, but that's our crucifixion window. I'll, I'll tell you, from Simon's words and just from the scripture itself, it's not surprising to me, and in, in knowing crucifixion, it's not surprising to me that Jesus' first words from the cross were a prayer. Who wouldn't be praying if they were in Jesus' spot, right? All of us probably would be, but what is amazing is what he prayed. What he prayed from that cross was just amazing. It was almost haunting, surprising, disturbing to some because they didn't understand the heart of this man who was hanging on the cross. How in the world could anybody be praying this kind of prayer when others were torturing him and trying to kill him? And yet he prayed, Father, forgive them, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. I want to take a look at these first words of Jesus from the cross, but the first thing I want to do is to look at who the they are. Who is he praying for? He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're... Who's the they in this prayer? And I think it's several people, quite frankly, and in many of these you will recognize from the story, but I think he was, of course, he was praying for those soldiers. Those soldiers had treated him cruelly. They, they always treated people cruelly who were going to crucifixion anyway because they were supposed to be criminals and so on and so forth. Even though Jesus was innocent, they treated him the same way, probably worse because of the sign that they had to place over his head that said King of the Jews. They put that crown of thorns on his head. Not everybody got that kind of uh, uh, reaction, you know, from the soldiers, but Jesus did. He was treated cruelly. And so what was he doing, you know, as they were preparing to gamble for his clothes? Below him, Jesus prayed for them, Father, forgive them. I believe he was also praying for the crowd. They didn't have television in those days. You guys know that. I mean, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of entertainment, if, especially if you weren't wealthy enough to buy a ticket to the Colosseum or whatever. Um, you had to find your own entertainment. And so at the day of crucifixion, that was entertainment. And folks showed up. They showed up. And one of the things they did was they taunted those who were on the cross. That was a part of the game that they played. And, and so as they, you know, begin this verbal assault on Jesus, what does he pray? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. 
And of course, there was those religious leaders. You guys have heard me talk about them before. You've heard Jesus talk about them before too. Out of jealousy and spiritual blindness, they had conspired with the Romans to kill Jesus, to have him put to death. For these hypocritical leaders, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that absolutely incredible, the love of this man who was going through what he was going through and would still pray for those in front of him, pray for all of them. As he hung on the cross, one of the most powerful images, I believe, in Scripture of the love of God, this image. But I think there's somebody else. I think we're missing somebody from this list. Who else was the them that Jesus was praying for? I believe this, folks. I believe that we are among the them. I believe that we are among the them. Because what was taking place here on the cross wasn't just for that time. I believe it transcends all time. It transcends all history in this world. This event was for all of humanity regardless of when they lived, even today. And so I think we were a part of the them that Jesus was praying for when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. There's an old gospel song, and if you look in your bulletin real quick, you'll see it's the last song of the day. So we're going to sing it before we're out of this place. But it's a song that says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? You guys know that song? You probably sung it before. Many of you do. And the answer is, in a, in a profound spiritual sense, yes, you were there. You were there. All of us were there. The entire human race was there. And folks, Jesus Jesus' voice here, he, he, what he was saying really gave voice to what he was doing on the cross. And the Apostle Paul uh, begins to describe this. I'll get into that a little bit later. But, but he was offering himself to God as, as a sacrifice for all of humanity. This is why he was there. He loved all of humanity this much. And you and I, we were there when they crucified our Lord. In a sense, Jesus was praying something like this. Father, he started at the very beginning, didn't he? Forgive Adam. I believe he was saying that, the first man in the, in the Bible that was mentioned, you know? First human being, Father, forgive Adam. And Father, forgive Ram. I want to tell you, that means something to me because I believe that's what Jesus was praying on that cross. He was praying for me even way back then. Father, forgive Ram. Forgive those in church. Forgive those on the streets. Forgive those in the country. Forgive those in the town. Father, forgive them. This, folks, is the power of the words of Christ as he hung on the cross. And they were prayed not only for those who stood there, but for followers of all time. He was praying for all of us. And because we are a part of that crowd, I want to share with you three truths, just quick truths from the scripture that I read today that we need to know about these first words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And the first one is this. And by the way, you've got an outline there in your bulletin. You can follow along, fill in the blanks a little bit. There's not a lot to fill in, but a simple one today. Uh, but the first thing is this, is we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. There's not a one of us in this room, in this world, that does not need forgiveness. And the fact that Jesus devoted one of his seven last statements, as painful as that was to speak out loud from the cross, remember pulling himself up by those spikes going through his wrists. The fact that he did that tells me this is very important and that we need forgiveness. That's what he was trying to get across. And it wasn't just for those on the cross. We need forgiveness, true. The, the truth is, all of us need forgiveness. You know why? Because of sin in our lives. It's a reality in every single one of our lives. There's not a one of us that is exempt. We all need this. And, and sin is a word we'd rather not talk about. Ram, do we have to talk about that word in our church? You know, um, but it, it's one of those words we don't like to talk about. It's kind of, kind of coarse, you know, it kind of hits home. We prefer things like mistake or slip up. Let's just call it a slip up, you know? Because that's easier to take, and that sounds... But, but the, I'll, I'll assure you, the Hebrew or Greek words that are used here are translated sin. And they mean this. They mean to stray from the path or to miss the mark, which kind of insinuates God has a path we should be on, and sometimes we choose another path, don't we? Sometimes we do, because we're human beings. Let me give you an example from my own life. This is a crazy example, but I'm telling you, this is what came to my mind when I was thinking about this this week, but I was probably in third or fourth grade. 
and uh, we were living in the parsonage. My dad was a Methodist pastor. We lived in the parsonage in South Wayne, Wisconsin. Anybody know where South Wayne is? It's down by Monroe in the southwest corner of the state, Highway 11 down there. And, and so we were living in the parsonage, and, and uh, you know, the front of the house was to a street, and the back of the house, we all had backdoor neighbors. Our, in the backs of the houses kind of faced each other on the other side of the block. And most of us had gardens, you know, in the back of our yards. And so we could look upon each other's garden. Maybe some of you grew up in a place like that too. But um, I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but one day I thought this was a great idea. Our neighbor had the nicest looking ripe tomatoes on the vines in her backyard, our back door neighbor. And as a really stupid kid, I thought to myself, I'm going to go grab some of those while nobody's looking. Little did I know. And I went and picked those neighbor, that neighbor lady's tomatoes. She was a widow lady. I went and picked her tomatoes. And then I used them as ammunition against my siblings. <laughs> I got four siblings. I thought it was a good idea at the time, third or fourth grade. So let me tell you something. What I didn't know was she was watching out her kitchen window when I did this and approached my folks later on. And I don't have to tell you the rest of the story, but I never did it again. But listen, third or fourth grade, guess who Rom was? I was a thief. I was the same as the person on the right or the left of Jesus on those crosses. I was a thief in third or fourth grade. You know what else I was? I was also a liar. Because when they asked me the first time, I denied knowing anything about it. Until I found out the neighbor was watching out the window. Then I couldn't really deny it. But folks, all of us sin, and when we get to be adults, the sin doesn't go away. Guess what happens? Unfortunately, you know, it doesn't go away. It just becomes more sophisticated. Our sins become more sophisticated. We're better at justifying what we're doing and even the bad choices we make. We're, we're, we're good at justifying those. So sin is one of those things that if you're a human being, you're dealing with. We're dealing with, and Jesus knew that. So what did he do? He dealt with it. That's the reason God sent him to the cross. That's the reason for this mission that he was on. But he dealt with it. I want you to hear me clearly today that, that the central message of the gospel or Christianity is not sin. It is not sin. That's simply the symptom or the diagnosis, okay? The, the, the aim of the gospel, folks, is, is not to make us feel guilty, but to help us discover the grace and healing mercy of God. Jesus provided forgiveness by what he did on the cross. That was the purpose of it. So that this, we were blocked from God before, now the way would be wide open because he took care. Guess what? When he died on the cross, he died for all of our sins ahead of time. Tomatoes. Jesus knew. He knew that even before I was born, that that's what was going to happen. He knew Ram would have to learn a hard lesson. And I'm guessing I'm standing here today because I learned that hard lesson. It's all a part of the journey, but all of us need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. You know, I, I just kind of put a blip here. Randy, this wasn't just for you. This is for me too, but it's kind of like heart patients, you know. We have chest pain. We go through this time where we can't breathe and we're having problems. That's not what we want to concentrate on, is it? We want to concentrate on the cure. Let's get to the surgery. Let's get to the stents. Let's open those arteries up. Let's get the blood flowing in. That's what we want to focus on. It is the same with the gospel. We don't focus on sin. We want to focus on God's grace, that he took care of these things for us, that he offers us forgiveness. And so we need forgiveness. Need I say more? That's enough. Here's the second thing. God's grace or forgiveness, you can use either one of those words in that blank there, is a gift. This is a gift because of what Jesus did on the cross. This is a gift to you and I. Do we deserve it? No. Did we ask for it? No. Did God love us enough to give it to us anyway? Yes. Because God knew who we were from the time of Adam, that we were fallen. We were a fallen race and that we would sin, and we needed forgiveness. And so he took care of that. Here's where the Apostle Paul comes in. He describes it this way in Romans chapter 5. He says, when we were utterly helpless, in other words, still thinking we were in control of our own lives, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. 
though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This was proactive, wasn't it, on God's part? This was proactive. So folks, the idea that Jesus was praying on the cross for our forgiveness and that he, even before we repented, died for us, that is just mind-bending. I mean, it's just an incredible thing. Before you were born, think about this. Before you were born, God knew your shortcomings. He knew the sinful things that you might do in your life. Tomatoes. And he would cover them. And he would co- I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. That's good news for me. But as we learned earlier, folks, you still have to do your part. Jesus has done his part, but we have to do our part. You know what our part is? God's grace is a gift. His forgiveness is a gift, but we have to accept it. The gift is no good unless you say thank you and accept it, right? Just like on Christmas. Jane had a grandpa that at Christmas time, I don't know why this comes to mind. At Christmas time, if he didn't like something, he'd, he'd look at the package and he'd open it. If it was something he didn't want, he'd look at somebody and go, you want this? Right in front of whoever gave it to him. That's just, he's just a blunt guy. He was just a blunt guy. Folks, we've got to take it. We've got to take it. We've got to accept that gift in order to put it into practice. Do you want Christ's forgiveness? You have to accept the gift. You have to accept Christ into your life and say, Jesus, you come be Lord of my life. I want that gift. I want to be a part of that. Give that to me. Wednesday night I talked about this, but I said something like this. Love begins when we let go. It's only when we let go that God can start to work in our lives like God wants to work in our lives. But we have to let go. Love begins when we let go. Here's the final thing I want you to know today, that Jesus intentionally modeled forgiveness. He didn't just tell us about forgiveness. He didn't just do the deed on the cross. He wanted to model forgiveness for us. So God's grace is not only a gift, it's also an example for us. Here's something to think about. Don't you think Jesus could have said what he said from the cross to himself? Have you ever wondered why he said these things out loud? Why did he choose to do that? That was the painful way of doing it. He had to haul himself up just to get the words out. It was a painful process when you're on the cross, the breathing and all that. He could have prayed to himself, couldn't he? Father, forgive them. No, he did it on purpose. Why? Because he wanted us to overhear. He wanted us to overhear. He wanted to be that example of forgiveness for us. And folks, those of us who choose to follow Jesus must practice forgiveness as he did. Listen to these examples quickly of Jesus' teaching on mercy and forgiveness. Matthew 5, 7 from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Those of you who forgive, you will receive God's forgiveness. Scripture tells us that. Matthew 6, when they asked Jesus how to pray, he said this, Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And then a couple verses later, he teaches this. He says, if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's what I was talking about. It's kind of reciprocal, isn't it? Don't ask me why. This is God's word. It's just the way it's set up, right? So we forgive others. God forgives us. But Jesus' actions, folks, in our following suit must go together. He's not only our example, but if we're his, we're going to act his way. We're going to do things his way and demonstrate his willingness to forgive sins. Father, forgive them, for they know, don't know what they are doing. Can you pray that prayer today? This is where the rubber meets the road. I just want to ask you, why in the world did Jesus teach so much about forgiveness? Because his disciples struggled with it. I mean, why else would he teach it over and over and over again for three years? He should have said it once and they got it. But no, they struggled with forgiveness. It's something we have to learn with God's help. So can you pray this prayer today? Love, folks, was behind everything Jesus did. Are you now willing to do the same? Are you willing to follow in Jesus' footsteps? The truth is, even Jesus' disciples, again, they struggled with this. Maybe we struggle with it too. And if you have ever struggled with forgiveness in your life, here's what I'm going to tell you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the only way to not struggle with forgiveness and learn how to do it. Keep your eyes on Jesus on the cross because that's why he was there. And if he can pray that prayer from a cross, surely you and I can pray it from the kitchen table or wherever we're at, you know, 
for somebody that we need to forgive. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He will show you. Just keep watching. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I just thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for the time we have uh, here in this worship service to get into your word, to hear these last words of, of Jesus from the cross, and thank you for helping us learn more about why he went to the cross, about this forgiveness today. And Lord, as we get ready to come to your table this morning, I just pray your blessings on, on these elements here, on the table, and the bread, and on the cup, that you would just bless them, Lord God, uh, to our memories. Help us never, ever to forget your incredible love for us, and also, may this be to your glory. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen.